Yeah. Whenever you're ready, Johnny. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you all for coming out here to show your support. We really appreciate it. Okay, uh, I would like to uh, introduce you to our guest. He hails from Decatur, Georgia. He's been in the industry a long time, directing movies, feature films, among other things. And please give a warm welcome to Mr. Stevens, Stephen Miller. Sweet. Say applause for the plane. How are you today, sir? Good, thank you. All right, so um, tell us, would you uh, please tell us about yourself? Sure. Uh, like you said, I grew up in, not grew up, I was born in Decatur, Georgia, but I grew up on the East Coast in Florida. Uh, I went to a film school uh, called Full Sail in Orlando. Um, I had a 13 month kind of like shoot you out program where you learn the basics of equipment and things like that. So uh, I did that when I was 21. So prior to that, I was sort of just floating around. I did a lot of music videos in the, late, I mean, the early 2000s, late 90s. And, so I graduated high school from 99. So from 99 to like 2001, I was uh, just shooting a lot of music videos for bands like Poison the Well and a lot of hardcore bands and stuff like that. And so uh, and then I started traveling with the CKY guys who eventually became Jackass guys. And so I was doing a lot of skateboard stuff for them. And uh, basically that's how I got my start learning my craft of filming because I also had to learn how to edit that stuff together. I was doing a lot of deck to deck editing while we were on the road and, and it was really Learned, I guess, the old school way of cutting and pasting, editing wise. And um, so, you know, I was sort of in a world of not understanding what I was doing, just random things with, with random people and not really having a point. And so I figured I'll go to film school because film school makes directors. And, and I, that was probably the dumbest thing I could think of. But anyway, so I, uh, you know, I went to film school and really quickly learned that they didn't teach me how to be a director, what they were teaching me was how to uh, work with other people in the industry and like learning the equipment, which helping me learn to be an editor, because I thought at first I wanted to be an editor. That was what I really wanted to do. I love editing, so I started out editing. And um, while I was in school, I met a few friends, and I happened to write a small screenplay called Automaton Transfusion, which was a short. And my friend, Will Clevenger at the time, talked me into expanding it into a feature while we were in school. So I was like, okay, I'll, I can do that. And uh, expanded it to a feature. And then we were pretty close to graduating. I was getting pretty frustrated with school because I kept hearing teachers in Florida say, don't go out to Los Angeles. You know, that's not where you want to be. You want to stay here and start off small, start off in new studios, blah, blah, blah. And uh, that was pretty irritating to me considering I spent a lot of money going to school. And I thought, well, they should be telling me to shoot for your, you know, go big, go big or go home. You shouldn't be like, here, stay in Florida and figure out what you're gonna do. So uh, so that really drove me at that point to say, okay, how am I gonna make this movie right now? Because I have all of the um, tools at my fingertips because the school was an, an insanely well-equipped school with any kind of gear you can think of, they had it. Um, and you have all the students who are hungry to make movies. And so um, <clears throat> I gathered uh, about $6,000 together and uh, got, Few of my friends together and said, "Hey, let's go make this movie, as Amazon Transfusion." And uh, we were probably a week into making it, and after the first week, um, I put out a trailer. I cut together a trailer or a first footage, and I put a trailer online, and somehow um, it got it went viral. This was through 2007. It went viral um, with Annie Cool News, and a bunch of other people saw it. So when we got a call from New Line Cinema, this, this, this like the eighth day of the shooting, which was we only shot for nine days. So the eighth day of the shooting, we got a call from New Line, and New Line was like, hey, we want to check this movie out whenever you're done. So obviously that was everybody's like, oh my god, New Line Cinema's calling. We have, have a hit. This is going to be huge. It's going to be great. And so it got everybody pumped up to get us through that ninth day, which was like a 22-hour day or something ridiculous. And finished, you know, finished the edit of the movie. And so I had the movie. I finished school, and I didn't know what to do with it other than New Line Cinema wanted to see the movie. So I, I was going to make the trek out to LA by myself, and I was going to figure out how to sell this movie. And after making the movie, I only had about two hundred dollars left to my name. So I, you know, got out here. I was sleeping in my car for about six to seven months, starting. I was staying at the Y in, in LA, West Hollywood, in Santa Monica, um, 
wherever I could shower, basically. Limited. Um, and while I was doing that, I was going to, um, well, right before that, I showed it to New Line Center. And New Line said, no, thank you. <laughs> and so now I'm out here with, because the movie wasn't completely done, had no sound design on it, there was no score. I was just showing them like a rough edit, thinking they'll understand, they'll get it, they're executives, they understand what a rough cut is, this is what the movie could be. They did not get it. They did not like it. They did not want anything to do with it. So uh, my first experience was being pretty hardcore rejected and not. And now knowing, knowing what what do I do? I'm out here. It's been five months that I'm out here with nothing. And I thought I had it tight enough for them to like. And so I uh, literally scrounged up another like two or three thousand dollars for calling friends and family and stuff like that, and found people on Craigslist to <clears throat> sound design the movie and score the film. And uh, then I. Uh, started making friends with the bouncers and the security guards at Paramount, Sony, Warner Brothers. Whatever bars they were going to, I was going to. And so <clears throat> I was hanging out there and I met a lot of guys and they, you know, I convinced these guys to let me on the studio box. <clears throat> and would say, hey, you know, I'm gonna, <laughs> can you walk me around to the places that would be the best place to put this DVD of the trailer for my movie? And they did, you know, hurry up, you can drop it off, get out of here. And so I, I was at the Sony lot, and I was dropping it off to a bunch of people in Ghost House, one of the one of happened to be somebody I dropped it off at. And I went back, and I was sitting down on one of the benches at the lot, and uh, a guy sat next to me and was like, you know, he, he thought I looked insanely not supposed to be there. <laughs> and he, he's like, you know, what are you doing here? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, so what are you trying to do? I was trying to design. I got this trailer for a movie, and I had it on my iPod. He watched it, and it happened to be Sam Raimi, who was watching it. And uh, Sam said, this is insane, what is this? And I was like, it's a little movie I made with my friends, and by this time I realized that this is Sam Raimi. And, uh, and then sweating and then stuttering, and then trying to tell him that I don't know what I'm doing here, don't get me arrested, you know? And then uh, Sam said, you got the whole movie? And I said, yeah, you know, I have like 100 DVDs in my trunk of my car. And he was like, well, we only one, so okay. And so like, Sam, the first person to ever watch my movie on the big screen was Sam Raimi, who took me back to the Sony lot. We watched it on the Sony lot with Sam and all of his executives at Ghost House. And uh, Ghost House wasn't buying movies at this time, it was 2008. So they were just trying to start their Ghost House line. And so Sam literally was like, we can't buy it, we're not there yet, our company's not ready to do it yet. But what I can do is I can walk you over to Bob and Harvey Weinstein at Dimension and Miramax, and I can have them watch it. And okay, and at that time, you know, that's exactly what happened. They, um, they walked it over there for me and uh, gave it to Bob and Harvey. Bob and Harvey watched the movie, they loved the movie. And then they tried to figure out what they were going to do with the movie. And it just so happened that they wanted to start their own, line, another separate division of uh, Dimension, which we call Dimension Extreme. So uh, because of my movie, they did Dimension Extreme and they put the Tomazon Transfusion out on their Dimension Extreme label. And so because of that, I was able to get out of my car and uh, you know have a place to, to live. But that was. Uh, 2008, and so it was released in 2008. It did limited theatrical release, and then it did straight to, to DVD. And then, you know, there was a weird thing that happened at that point, which was DVDs went away, basically blockbusters went away, and nobody was really wanting to, to do, you know, to buy DVDs or anything like that. So it became imperative that I make theatrical films. Um, and to try to do that was, it felt like it was easier because now studios were calling me, and I had now signed with an agent at UTA, and I had signed with a manager, and so like, you know, everything felt like, oh, this is becoming much smoother and easier, and I'm gonna make, you know, Transformers. And uh, that also was not the case, because I learned a really hard lesson, like, I got attached to, uh, I got attached to a movie at Fox Atomic, I got attached to a movie at Paramount, I got attached to a movie at MGM, and really big movies. And, uh, and it happened that, MGM crashed, they went bankrupt. Fox Atomic crashed, they went bankrupt. And uh, Paramount Vantage, they they crashed. They and so this was like 2010, and like the whole DVD market crashing had a big play, and all the studios dropping their smaller uh, indie divisions, basically, that were going to be doing the six to twelve million dollar movies. So, so all of my movies that I had instantly died, and I've been doing a year and a half of development on these movies, and I thought, well, okay, so. What do I do now? And quickly learned that I was only as good as my last movie, which was now 2008, so that's what, three years ago. And nobody did shit. So, and so it was like, 
So, so I quickly realized that that was the case. And any studio that I was trying to get into and, and get meetings at and do these kind of things, meetings were happening. They've always sort of happened, but I wasn't getting I wasn't getting hired. And it was because it was getting very clear as I hadn't done a movie for over a million dollars, and the movie that I had done for you know what they thought was thirty was really ten. It was good, but it was now three years old and nobody cared. And I wasn't that guy that was sort of like the hot young guy coming up anymore. So. Um, I had to uh, sort of shift gears and rethink and sort of like and go back to my roots. And uh, I found these producers that have been wanting to work with me, but that were making smaller movies, like $50,000, $100,000 movies. And so I uh, jumped on board with those guys, and they had two movies that I really loved. Um, one that they let me literally fell from the ground up, which is called Under the Bed. And then another one that was sort of like a departure for me from horror films, is sort of like an action movie. It's called The Aggression Scale. and. Um, the aggression scale and under the bed both made for hundred thousand dollars, you know, shot them in like twelve days. And uh, made them back to back. And aggression scale got done first. And aggression scale last year went to South by Southwest. They played really big at South by Southwest. And while I was there, uh, luckily uh, one of the producers for Silent Night, uh, Richard Saperstein, who did like seven Fight Club, he was at Dimension when they bought my first movie. He was like, What have you up to? I was like, Well, obviously I'm driving, you know, make movies, and I'm here, I have one that's in South Fight, so he's like, look, I'm doing this movie called Silent Night in Anchor Bay, and so, luckily, I was able to go make a movie, you know, like a, a really great budget level, and, uh, and that's sort of like where I'm at now, it's like, I got to go make that last year, I made that in <clears throat> May of last year, the movie hit the theaters in November, and then Blu-ray, DVD in December, and then uh, my movie that I made before Silent Night, Call Into the Bed, is actually hitting theaters this July. So um, sort of rolling now has been good, and like I, you know, I'm leaving in uh, in July to start my next movie in Louisiana, and uh, that's with Cassie in LA. Cassie did all this last year, and so uh, you know, it's just now it's starting to really start to go back again and start to move again, which is great. Uh, but it was a time where it was very stagnant and stale. I felt like I was going to have to move back home at some point, and so, uh, but it really wasn't for the past two years that's just really started snowballing. And got my footing again and actually making some movies that I think like the next movie that I'm going to go make with Cassie will probably be my first big theatrical film that will play wide and so I'm excited about that one. Um, but yeah, and then you know I have some family that are, I live out here now because uh, my wife's family lives out here and we moved out here once we had a kid. And, uh, this is one of the places that they introduced me to and I thought this was a cool little spot um, and so I was happy to come back and hang out. I guess that's myself. <laughs> In a long way. All right, and um, let's talk about Silent Night. Mm -hmm. A little bit more about Silent Night. Okay, now uh, for those of you who are who like like to watch older movies and such, um, Malcolm McDowell, mm -hmm. who's the main actor in the movie. Now, this is a guy who got to work with one of the masters of cinema, Stanley Kubrick, in The Clockwork Orange. And would you just uh, tell us what it like uh, your experience on working with an icon like that? Malcolm's awesome. Yeah, I mean it's a, it's difficult to work with a guy like that. I think at first because you're not sure what you can talk about, what you can't talk about, and you don't want. I mean he's older, and so you don't know like if, he's, if you're gonna rub him the wrong way or whatever. But but Malcolm was really great, and I and I shared this with you up there is that <clears throat> you know getting Malcolm was sort of really interesting because I was already up in Winnipeg prepping the movie. And I'd been up there for two weeks, and we were talking about cast and who we were going to go out to. And I thought I had saw Malcolm in my hotel. And so, you know, I talked to the producers, and I said, I think McDowell's in the hotel somewhere, floating around. I said, call whoever you have to call, find out where he's at. I want to meet with Malcolm because I think he'd be great for this movie. And that was the case. And so they, you know, the agents called Malcolm, and Malcolm was like, "Who's this dude?" And I was like, "Just have breakfast with me. I'm not asking you to be in this movie. Just have breakfast with me. We can talk about, you know, a little Clockwork Orange and Stanley Kubrick. We can talk about Cat People, which is." An Movie that I did like. And so uh, Malcolm he sat, sat down at breakfast with me and we ended up hanging out for like three hours. And uh, the next thing I know, Malcolm was like, I would definitely do Silent Night, which was a shock because it's such a ridiculous movie. And, uh, it, and it was great because I, I knew, and I think one of the reasons why he did this is what I told him was like, the script is not good. <laughs> and I was like, it's not that it's bad, it's just that it's B movie bad fun. And I was like, in the dialogue, the only way this is going to work is if it has some flair. 
and Malcolm, anything Malcolm says is, is just cool. So it's like, I knew if Malcolm was saying this, they would take it to another level, and it would become a movie that I think people could have a lot of fun watching and not just sort of roll their eyes. And, you know. and so, because it's Santa Claus, with a flame. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, for, that, for that kind of movie, you really need, you, you really need an actor, and actors, because Jim King also came on. So it was like you needed a Donald Lowe, and so you needed these guys that were really knew how to work in this space, but were elevated beyond this. So the idea for them to come do something like this with me made a lot of sense because they got to have fun and just sort of mess around. You sort of need on the humor aspect more of it than the, the horror aspect, which is I think helped. And uh, so you know he's just one of those guys that's really great. And we we talked about clockwork. We talked about lots of things. And he you know I, one of the things I did for Malcolm was probably make sure he was in a good mood. Was is I never shot Malcolm past eleven o'clock at night. Even if we were doing night shoots, I made sure we were should be we were shooting Malcolm early enough that he could be out by eleven p.m. And so you know I just didn't want him to be cranky. So he he was really great about you know that kind of stuff and getting all bloody and fighting Santa Claus. It was cool. It was really cool. Wow, sounds like a really good experience. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, anytime you have Malcolm like. Like face to face, I don't, and if you see the movie. He has this one line in the movie that he completely ad libbed, uh, and it's like the final moment in the movie. It's like Malcolm, and Santa, Santa's got a flamethrower, Malcolm that's got a gun, and uh, you know he says a line like, you know, uh, oh crap, what does he say? He says something like, he says uh, don't bring a flamethrower to a gunfight. Gun yeah, it's like, you know, he said that, and I was like, oh yeah, we gotta keep that line. That is awesome. <laughs> like, who would say that? Like, who was gonna say that line? Whoever said that, that's awesome. Who said that? Yeah, you, you're awesome. And so that's one of my favorite lines of the movie. So, uh, but anyway, he's he's a great guy. So he just added that. No, I mean, and, I, and I'm that, I guess I'm that kind of director anyway. Like, I don't like to go by the page. Just not who I. I like the actor to come in and take over that role. And if that means the dialogue changes, the dialogue changes. I'm not a stickler to that because I think that's ridiculous. Like if they're gonna sit there and like read the page, then it's not real to me. And I can see that, I can feel that. So like, if it's going to be real, it has to be really what they're gonna say. And Malcolm is one of those guys, anybody's gonna do that, whether I say it or not. And so I just let him do it. I mean, that's one of the first conversations we had, which was, you know, I sort of come from that Woody Allen's sort of school of directing, which is I hired you because you're awesome. I didn't hire you to tell you what to do. Like, I'm gonna come into the room and tell you, this is how I need you to move and kind of go through that. But I also like to play with the floating camera, so that way the actors can do give them a space and then they move and then I have to work around them, which I think to me is much more comfortable for the actor. It's a little bit more difficult for a crew to to work around, but to be honest, like I, that's something I enjoy. I'd rather the actors come in, do their thing, and then I can plot out where I'm gonna shoot everything after I've seen them sort of do a run through. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, it was a good experience. Wow, and um, could you also tell us uh, what it, your experience is on working with uh, Jamie King? Yeah, Jamie's great. I mean, she's one of you know she's a screen queen, so she's fantastic. She did my play Valentine, and that's the reason that I came to Jamie is because I think she she was great in that movie in Sin City. She's really great, and so she's on a TV show and she's on like a little light WB show. And so I was like, you know, this would be fun for you to sort of not be so clean. You know, you can be a little crazy, and she gets to fight Santa at the end. And I thought that was and in the original script she didn't, and so it was sort of like one of my ways to lure her in, I guess, a little bit, and she'd probably laugh at that, is that, you know, I told her, you, you will fight Santa at the end, and you will win, because originally it was supposed to be Donald Logue who does it, and I think Donald got mad that he did, but, and so, it did eventually rewrite it so that Jamie could come in and be the hero, and uh, I think it makes sense, because obviously she, it's her character, it's her movie. Um, but uh, she's just one of those actors that is able to come in, and we can be joking around, and having fun one second, and then as soon as I say action, it's crying and tears, and just insane, insane, like, uh, just presence. She just knows what she needs to do, when she needs to do it, and I don't have to say a lot, which is great, because I'm not, I don't like to be that guy, just like, give me some emotion, give me some cry. I feel so cheesy when I'm sitting there telling actors, like, cry, like, be emotional, like, it's just not, like, my thing. My thing is to go in and be personal with them, and I like to try to find something that relates to them, and then, so it's not me telling them how to, to act, it's me more or less communicating how I feel this present, what it needs, and she comes in and delivers that. So it's just a, it's a fun experience when you can have an actor like that who you don't need to physically shout out instructions to. It's just, this is how I feel like the scene should go, we talk about it, we get a sort of personal connection to it, and then she does it. 
Um, so she made a very easy kind of movie. I mean, we made this movie in 16 days. So uh, you have to be moving rapid pace. So you're like two, three takes, keep moving. Um, she was just really great. The comp was the same way. She was really good. Yeah. I mean, we and we also had people that were brand new. So, I mean, the little girl in the movie had never done the movie before, um, and it was difficult for her to be in the one or two take land because she never done a movie before, never even set in front of a camera before. So, uh, you know, it was fun to work with her too because it's it's always fun to work with kids. I think they're they're more accepting to what's going on around them, and they they take direction really well. So, she's great. And um, can you also talk about uh, your newest uh, movie coming out, Under the Bed? Under the Bed. Yes. Under the Bed is like a, uh, I grew up I grew up in the 80s. Not really grow up in the 80s. I was like 10, you know, in 89. So, uh, but I, I guess through the 90s I grew up watching 80s movies. That's sort of my connection, like Evil Dead and, and uh, the Goonies and E.T. and Poltergeist and <clears throat> those kind of movies. Like, the movies that were like kids took on adult problems. That was what I really connected to, and I really loved Stand By Me, you know, things like that. That like, when anytime you could take kids and put them in adult situations and have them deal with that is something that I connected to, like Gremlins. And so, Under the Bed is that movie for me. It's it's an homage to to Gremlins, an homage to E.T., an homage to Ultra Guys, and then take that and mix it with Little Monsters, where you have this monster under the bed. So it's basically these two brothers who know that there's this entity under the bed, and they have to team up to fight it because no adults believe them in this typical 80s fashion, where the adults don't believe, they have to do it themselves, and uh, it's sort of like an adventure in that standpoint, so it's like, for 45 minutes, you know, you're really on this adventure with these kids and trying to figure out what's going on, but then I guess I sort of, like, take it to another level, and I wanted to see how intense I could make a kid's movie if I was going to do, you know, Goosebumps, like, how far could I take Goosebumps, and, uh, yeah, it's got an R rating, so it went far, <laughs> so, like, an hour into it, like, you know, some people get like, oh my god, killing kids. <laughs> and so, like, um, but, uh, so, the, you know, so that was a, that's one of those movies that's really uh, sort of like my baby a little bit because I really, from the beginning, from story to shooting to everything, I, I was really involved heavily on it because I really wanted it to be engulfed in that 80s cinema. In fact, even the way we shot it, I shot it with the, uh, the exact same anamorphic lenses that they used on the Goonies and Poltergeist. And so we literally went to, uh, Panavision and I requested what were the exact lenses they used, and they still had them. And so I was able to shoot with those lenses on the camera. And uh, so it, I, it's just a real nostalgic kind of movie. The way the movie flows, the way the movie, you know, the kids interact, all of that stuff, it, it's very nostalgic. And so, uh, uh, yeah, so that movie, and it's actually got Johnny Weston. Johnny Weston is a, a guy that everybody can know in like six months. He did Chasing Mavericks just this past year with Gerard Butler, but he just got hired to star in the new Michael Bay movie, and so he, he's going to be the lead in the new Michael Bay movie. That's going to be insane, and so you know he's going to be gigantic. And then Gatlin Griffin is the younger kid. Gatlin was the uh, the uh, the son of Angelina Jolie in The Changeling. Um, he was Little Green Lantern in The Green Lantern. He was Little Ryan Reynolds in Green Lantern. Um, but he's just one of those guys. He's also got like, this gigantic movie coming out in August. So I was lucky enough to work with two young actors that I think are going to be really, really great. And, and the movie rode on these two because if they didn't work, the movie didn't work because if nobody believed that they were in this situation, then you know it just wasn't going to happen. So we got lucky with them. And the movie's taken a while to come out purely because nobody knows how to market this movie. And uh, it's just it's such a strange mix of 80s monster movie that it's had a hard time trying to figure out how they're going to market it. So, uh, I'm interested to see what people think of it because it's so ridiculous. Uh, not in a comedy way, but just in a, you think you were in this kind of a movie and then you're completely thrown into another movie. And so uh, I'm excited to see how people really act. And it's, it's doing it July 19th. I think it's to, it'll do like a, a limited release, which means they'll probably do 25 or 30 cities theatrical, which is the same thing Silent Night did. Um, and that usually means it plays here pretty locally everywhere. Um, and how, you know, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, uh, Chicago, New York, that kind of stuff. Like the major markets it'll play. And then it'll do uh, Blu-ray, DVD, VOD, Redbox on July 30th. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's just sort of my, it's my slow burn horror movie, I guess. 
you know, so it's very different from cyanide, which is crazy, fun, gory, splatter flick, and then under the bed's very different. And if you haven't seen aggression scale, aggression scale is also very different in the sense that it's like home alone radar. And it's like, what would happen if the bad guys came in? <laughs> Instead of Kevin McAllister like hitting them with pipes, he was like stabbing, you know, he was like taking them out, you know. And so uh, it's very, that's again another movie where I take kids and I them in this ridiculous situation. But I was always surprised that nobody made a Home Alone rated R version. Like, why is this kid not, why is there not a kid out there taking out the bad guys like legit? And so, <laughs> and so that's basically what we did. It was like, it was a home invasion movie. I, I like home invasion movies, but I just think home invasion movies are so played. And so it was like, what can we do on a home invasion movie that hasn't been done? It's like, oh yeah, well, let's just have the kids start destroying these guys. And so that's basically what we did. So it's fun. So uh, I guess that's sort of like my thing, what kind of movies I like, is I like movies that, that deal in those, those kind of worlds. and. Trying out different things. It's a very scale sort of action, and then under the bed is very slow burn, and it's just silent. It's very B movie, B slasher. So, and then the next movie I'm doing uh, in July is uh, very much like a thriller. Um, sort of like the one line concept is uh, teens in a limo. Limo goes off the cliff underwater. The whole movie's underwater in the limo trying to get out. And so, very like, I guess buried is a good reference of what kind of movie this feels like. But um, you know. So I'm just sort of like picking my my moments, I guess, of what movies I want to do because I'm not just a horror guy. I like horror movies, but I'm much more of like thriller action in the world is what I like to do. Yeah. And um, also, uh, one last question, then I'll turn the questions over to you guys. Um, what advice would you give to uh, like young filmmakers trying to get their foot in the door, their feet wet? I mean, I think, I think going out and making your own movie is like the most imperative thing, especially now because you have every opportunity. I mean, I, I, live, I live on YouTube and these guys that are making these short films like that are insane, like what you can find with these guys that are so good at the visual effects and digital stuff and like and are like 18 and 20 years old and like the camera equipment's there. I mean, dude's got the, what is that one? T3I. T3I. I mean, I've seen several features made on that thing, you know, and they look amazing. And so uh, the equipment is there. Uh, I think making shorts is pointless to me. Like I don't see the point in doing that. I, I think you can't sell a short. And so for me, I always tell my friends who are in film school or coming out here or anybody that even contacts me on Facebook or whatever because I get a lot, it's just that you go make a movie because there's no way you're going to learn what you need to learn on a short film. And making a feature, you will learn what you did wrong, how you did it wrong, and it's better to make mistakes on a feature that you funded that you you know if even if nobody sees it's just better to do that than someone giving you half a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars and you making mistakes on that and somebody else is dying. So I always recommend people just going out. If you have the yeah, you have the tools it's it's ridiculously cheap to be able to make a movie. I mean in two thousand seven I made a movie for you know at the end of the day automaton cost like nine thousand dollars. We shot it in nine days and we had at one point 500 extras of zombies running through downtown. We shut down downtown Orlando, Florida. So like, I mean, we did all of that with absolutely no time. And that's, that's just simply because we asked. And like, I think a lot of people understand. You can just ask. And like, there are people out there that are willing to help. And like, that's what we did. I mean, we went to the Florida Film Commission. I said, hey man, like, I need to get two blocks. And he was like, okay, you can have two blocks. We got down there, 500 people showed up to be zombies. My makeup guys are like, what the hell? And I was like, I was expecting like 10 people, you know what I mean? Like 500 people like, responded from flyers and, and stuff like that. And so like, and then, you know, we literally, I went to talk to the, the officer, his name Officer Booze, and I was like, oh, this is gonna be awesome. And, he was, and I was like, dude, can I get maybe one more street? And he was like, uh, because he's our officer for the day. And then the next, next thing you know, he shut down like 10 streets. And so we were like, literally looked like we had this desolate landscape. And so for a movie that was on like $6,000, when I brought it out here, once the score was on it, and funny enough, the people that turned down Automaton at, at New Line Cinema is actually the guys who hired me to make Side Line. And so uh, he constantly would tell me, I'm sorry we didn't buy that movie, because that movie made Dimension extremely amount of money. So like, uh, you know, it's just it's just a thing, you know what I mean? Like, you can make the movies look big, you can make them look like scale. It's really not difficult to give things a bigger budget. I think you don't have to have the permit. Some people get you have to have. You can just ask. I, I don't know, I think my, my biggest advice is to go make a movie. And I think that you can, uh, 
everybody in this room has the ability to talk to, I'm sure, that has a day camera. And you don't have to have you know, the greatest lighting. You can figure out a script that you can shoot for mostly during the day. And uh, you know, the, the best thing to do is spend all your money on audio. And if you can have a great audio guy getting all your audio, then you will have a movie. Because the worst thing to do is to hand over a copy of a movie that sounds like it's coming off that camera. Or it's coming on. It's the 100% guaranteed cheap people will not. And I think I've learned that from being in in the um, world where my friends are coming in and trying to get the movie sold to studios. And, and the guy, the execs really have such a short attention span that the trailer has to be good, number one. But number two, they will not watch it. The dialogue sounds like it does not sound like a movie. I don't know how to explain it other than spend your money on audio. <laughs> Make it sound like a movie. And that becomes in post audio as far as making it score, sound design, whatever it is, whatever money you're spending, put it in post in as far as the the audio because on screen stuff you can shoot that and you can get that done. You should be able to do that very cheaply. All right. So uh, does anyone else have questions that they'd like to ask? <laughs> um, I just stay motivated. How do I stay motivated? Um, I guess I just didn't have anything else to do. I, I, I really was, it was my, the reason I stepped in my car for a year and a half is I refused to get a normal job. Refused. I absolutely told myself, if I was going to need a normal job, I'd be And I wasn't going to let that happen, but that meant I had to sleep in the ditch. I didn't get on my car. There was a moment I was going to have to sell my car if the movie didn't sell. And it sold. And so I got lucky. But it really was, I was putting myself in a position to succeed, I guess, that I wasn't was unable to fail. I couldn't go any lower. You know what I mean? I was out here, had no family, I knew nobody. And so I started to meet people that I was like, hey, can I shower at your place? And then, you know, okay, so you, whatever, you have to shower. But like the, the motivation was to, to live, I mean, to survive. And that's that's the only motivation that I felt like would keep me doing it. Because if I, I could have called my parents at any time and said, hey, I'm sleeping on the end, idea. Hey, I'm sleeping in my car, can I get help? You know, they would help me. Yeah, but. At the end of the day, I felt like that didn't didn't do what I needed it to do for myself. And for myself, I felt like if I was going to make it, I had to make it on my own, and I had to figure out how I was going to get there. So the motivation was always to stay. <laughs> like, and I guess like I'm not saying quit your jobs and do whatever, but I mean that you have to find whatever that is, that passion that it keeps you going. I mean that's just what it is, and I think a lot of people forget that I mean, a lot of this a lot of this stuff out here, especially the people that I've. I've Met out here, it's, all, it's a hobby. Like this is something they're doing in their spare time. They, it's cool. Like they like movies. They watch it all the time. That's cool. You know what I mean? But it's not. They're not willing to lose everything for that job for what they want to do. And I guess that's where I got to the point where I was willing to lose everything. Uh, and I think at some point you have to be at that moment where it's just like I'm willing to, to take the jump. And for me, it was leaping out to here. I mean, the great thing about you guys is you're right out here, and you have all these things at your fingertips to sort of grab a hold to and like you can, you know, you're not living in your car, you live pretty close, you know, so it's like you can go out there and come back. Um, but uh, I think it's about finding what what pushes you to that limit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about crowdfunding sites like, uh, like Kickstarter? Kickstarter did help, help you. I think, you know, good question. Because Kickstarter to me is like a, I like Kickstarter. I mean, I can't say I hate it. I mean, you get your money to make a movie, right? If it's, it's free money. You don't have to pay it back. It's like whatever you, you make the movie and then you sell it and it's, it's yours. And I, I guess I sort of did sort of like a Kickstarter when they didn't have it, which was like just like going around the family. Like, you know, but I, I, there's there's also like the reverse side of it where I think it's lazy to the point where it's like you're, you're asking all these people to help you and then they're getting certain things, you know. But I don't want to say it's good or bad. It's just one of those things. If you if it make gets you money to make a movie, then do it one hundred percent. But I do think there's ways of doing it yourself. I don't know. It feels like it's just like I don't know what kind of money that is coming in. It's just not my money that I'm putting on screen. It's like I don't know. Uh, there's something about that it's, that does the thing with my movies. I was gonna make it. The money that I got even really wasn't from my friends and family. It was more or less the loans that I took out to make my money, to make my movie. And so school loans out and. Uh, and so I can I'll, delete it. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. This, but what it was school loans, you know, like literally, like didn't have, didn't really finish my last few months of school because I took those loans straight that movie. So I think it's would be cool. I think it's just it depends on how it's used, I guess. Yeah. 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 Ye
I guess you, you didn't really feel too good about. I mean, you you didn't like that approach yourself because you wanted to be the person. Yeah, I felt like I didn't. I wouldn't would feel like I owned it. Yeah. If I made, if I went through KSTAR, I would feel like I owned it. I feel like I owe people uh -huh. with my success. More right. my, more. And then I feel like I'm constantly saying, well, it's because of all these people that paid for my movie. I don't know. There's something weird about that too. So I like I was really for me it was about uh, making doing it myself. I don't. Know, it doesn't have to be anybody else's thing. That was just my my thing was doing it myself. And if I was going to make it, it was about me saying I did it because I was passionate about this, and I didn't have to take anybody's money. I didn't have to take anybody's house. I didn't have like because there's plenty of times where people were like, "Well, we can put you up here, yeah, but if you put me up, then I'm living for free on your couch." And I'm just not so it's like I just there was a, there was a lot of like I guess pride factors, but a lot of like factors. But again, it goes back to that first question, which is if I do that, then I get lazy and I start thinking. You know, I'm here. I don't have to work as hard because I have a place to stay. So it was for me. It was like, where can I be that's going to keep me pushing harder? Nice. Uh, hey, thanks for coming. In, man. Yeah. And, uh, Misa Holtman too. About the story. Sure. I, I, uh, appreciate that. Yeah. Um, my question is, uh, you know, I don't know if you know, so you talked about ad libbing mm -hmm. in some of your films. Yeah. You know, and you shoot real quick. You know, nine days, sixty days. How important is that? I mean. Do you support that? I mean, is that something that you find that you just have to go on the wire where you're just like, hey, let's just see if we can improv improvise this scene. Do you, do you typically like to you know, yeah. do one your way and then have the actor do one your way? No, you know, like, I really don't have time to do, like, several roles. So I, I literally, for the most part, I'm working a lot in pre-production. Like, I, even if my actors are not there, I'm calling, and we'll talk about a scene on, on Skype, or we'll talk about a scene on the phone. And so by the time they get to set, there's already that communication, so when we get to set, I'm already saying, remember what we talked about last week? Let's, let's try to go there, let's find that, because that was the best spot. So they already know where they want to be when they get there, so it's not a surprise. Um, and I, I try to do as many meetings with my actors as possible, because I, I think it's such a great relationship, number one, because I love I love people that I, I think actors are a special breed, and like they're very open, and, and then they have a lot of experiences going on, but I like, because I like to bring, I guess, I like to bring those experiences to set, because if I need you, to start crying, or if I need you to get really emotional, I know what buttons to push to do that. And if we've hung out and we've become friends, because that's important, like, I'm gonna be experiencing you for nine days, 16 days, you know, in bigger movies, you're talking there with 160 days. So if you're gonna be there and emotions are flying, or, you know, things get hectic and crazy, you have to be, you have to, you have to know that that person has your back, and that they have to know that I have their back. So that's just an important thing. So by the time you get to set, there's already sort of that camaraderie and like, okay, you're gonna do this, so when they get there, I'm not yelling. I'm not that kind of director. I'm not like a tyrant guy. Like, I, I, I sit back, I hang out. I'm constantly moving. Like that's one thing that people, weirds people out is that I don't I don't have a chair. Or I don't take director's chair. Like I I'm moving. I'm standing at the monitor. When it's done, I'm running to you. I'm talking to you. I run back. I'm moving constantly, and I feel like it's sort of like a pace thing. If I'm paced up well, then everybody else's energy stays up. So I, it's sort of like what I like to do, and that sort of feeds into the acting. So if my energy's up. They're already at like number ten as soon as we start out the gate. So I don't have to get to ten take to get them to be like up here. We just start there, and so uh, there's just certain tactics like that that I do. Some some instances I'll bring in music, and like I'll have speakers set up, and we'll sit there for for two minutes, sort of like moment of silence type deal before we start going into it. And I'll play a score of what I think this scene is, and sometimes I play the score for them to act to. And, and then we take it out, and then we do it again. So they already have like a, a feeling of what the mood's gonna be for the movie. Um, and so I learned that, it's interesting enough, I learned that shooting music videos. I learned that whatever music video I was shooting, if I was shooting a metal video, the intensity was huge all day long. People were like, ah, all day long. But I was shooting like uh, an emotional pop video, like everything, like everybody's kind of moving slow, going over here. So I learned that like the music played a factor. Like it was, whatever music was blaring all day long, that's what these people were reacting to. So I took that into filmmaking, and, and I really use that a lot. You know, so it's like I really try to find what captures the mood, especially the first day. And the actors that are coming their first day, I try to get light and like, playing things that they're excited about, and it gets kind of epic, I guess. And it's like you know, so if they're you know, sign on, you get a three million dollar movie, but you know, we want this to feel like an eighty million dollar. And how do you do that? Oh, well, let me get some Jerry Rock. You know, it's like something from like The Rock or something. I'm gonna throw it in there so people get like, what is this? You know, it shouldn't be here. But what it is, is just, it's just a, a mind thing. It's like mindset. Like how do I get on the same level with you guys? So, yeah. Anybody else? Yes. 
Okay, so how do you get to the point where you're actually on the set, like cast? What do you look for, like in the auditions and stuff? That says, oh, I want that person to be in my movie. I like I like people to talk to me. To be honest, like I like we, you know, you go through. I go through casting directors, obviously, like, and then they bring in a lot of the people. They bring in a lot of big people or whatever. And you and you you see people come through. And I think a lot of the mistakes that the actors that I see come through, they come in, they sit and they leave, and there's never really that interaction. I like interaction. I like when they come and hang out with me. Hey, I really want this. Tell me why you like this script. Like they're not just sitting down. Okay, they start reading because I've been in countless sessions where people just it's like a cattle call, right? They just come in, they sit, they read their line, and they're out. But I think the ones that I gravitate to are the ones that come in and immediately say what they like about the material first. This is why I like the script. This is why I feel connected to this character. And then that starts already has my brain thinking. Well, great, they've thought about this. They're invested in this. And so by the time they start doing their thing, I'm already sort of like pushed one way, you know what I mean? Because it's sort of like hit a nerve with me, which is like, hey, you enjoyed it, you read it, you know, even if it's just a side, like I connected with that piece of material. And so I, I like that, I like the interaction, and so it's not just, you know, you're there doing your thing, you got 10 of them that day, okay, you're this director that I'm dealing with on this one. No, it's something that's, even if it's not that special to you, I would try to make it special to you. You know, like it really let the director in the room know that this is special to you. Because that goes a long way. Because they're, you have to realize they're seeing thousands of people that day, and literally. And so it's it's important to stand out. And to stand out is by trying to find that emotional connection in the room. And you only have that five minutes. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that in that five minutes? And it's always how you lead in. It's like I'm in. I love this. This is great. Excited. Blah blah blah. You know, I think it's important for me. <laughs> you know, like for me. So I, I'm assuming that's a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, first of all, congratulations on all your success. Thank you. It's an amazing story. Um, what's one director, actor, producer you would love to work with? Um, you know, that's a good question. Like, <laughs> I, I would love to work with, I probably, I would love to work with JJ. So, like, JJ is a guy that like, I, sort of like, and Sam's a guy, same, same world where Sam came from making Evil Dead to the Spider-Man movies. And so both of those guys started out really small with like Freaks and Geeks and then out of making Star Trek right now. So it's like, those are the guys that I sort of idolize and look up to because I'm not, I don't want to make indie movies. That's not my goal. I was to make movies that are on Blockbuster just sitting there. Like my goal is for you to go see my movie at Cineplex. Yeah. And so I've always had that thought process and that's sort of like, it's still sort of, I'm sort of still in my car, in my head. And so when I look at those guys and like what they're doing, like how do I get to that? And then those are the guys that, that I, What do you think of uh, web series uh, as a way to get your foot in the door? I love web series. I think web series are awesome. Like, I think I've got a Kickstarter because I think that is a Kickstarter. Like, if you're in web series, to me, like, everybody should have a YouTube account that wants to be a Like, everybody should have that account that they are trying to get out there. Like, I think it's so crucial. It's not, if it's not a web account, if it's not YouTube, it's in your own website that is promoting your material because you can sell your material on your website. I think, like, People aren't, like I was telling you, guys, people aren't buying physical copies of anything. So it doesn't cost you anything to sell your stuff. I mean, you can open up an uh, Amazon account, you can open up iTunes account, you can open up, I mean, even Netflix. Netflix will buy your material. Like, so it's like, you should be out there trying to sell everything digital. Because uh, hard copies of anything you just aren't selling. It's just not the way it works. So I think web series are hugely popular. And if you can find something that, that hits, you just you know, you've got a great thing going on because people want to spend money to put their ads on your site or spend money to put their ad on YouTube, whatever. Several of my friends, that's just their job. That's all they do is manage their web series accounts because they, it's a great idea. I love it. Uh, in fact, there's been plenty of things that I've, I mean, personally, like, would love to do web series because I think it's a way to reach out to an audience, connect with the audience, and um, build your audience. Because like for me, like saying I want to make those bigger movies, well, it would be great if I had already had a built-in audience. So by the time I got there, that it was just a no-brainer that the movie was going to do well. And that's what's great about these movies doing limited theatrical. They get they start that built-in audience. And I've actually thought about doing web series because I think it's just a great way to interact with everybody. It's like you know, you put it on Twitter or Facebook or whatever. And like, I'm a huge social network guy, um, so I, I like all that stuff. It's really great. Yeah. Hey, uh, your ideas are pretty out there, man. All the, you know, <laughs> exactly. It's pretty crazy. Um, 
Uh, when you come up with something like that, I mean, do you, I mean, you know, I assume you came up with the idea. Well, like the, no, the, uh, like, it's like, like, Silent Eyes remake of uh, Silent Eyes Deadly Night, which is an 1980s horror film. Mm -hmm. and, and the original movie is completely messed up. I mean, it's like, <laughs> messed up. You know, like, my movie's messed up, but my movie's not, like, mean spirited. Mine's just like, so, like, fun and, like, poking at Christmas, whatever. It's not my dead movie, it's a mean movie. <laughs> like, like, it is a mean movie. There's Santa Claus raving off. It is a mean movie. Do you know what I mean? So, when they came to me with this script, it was a big thing for me that I, I don't like that stuff. That's not, I don't, I like the movie. This is the original movie, and I, and I understand where those things are coming from. My, I don't like that stuff. I'm not a fan of, like, if you have to close your eyes and, like, close your ears and, like, zone out, I don't like that movie. You know? So, uh, so when they came to me, they were like, what can we do to amp up Santa? And because the original movie, he's just a dude with an axe. He's pretty boy, actually. He's like, you know, handsome as any of you guys. He's like, dude with an axe, he's singing a song, he kills people, it's really weird. And so it was like, what can we do to amp up Santa? And me and the writer really talked about one of the real life things that happened here in California was a Santa Claus with a flamethrower. Was the Santa Claus went to his wife and flamed his wife. And so we were like, that's very interesting. <laughs> and so he, he, the writer came back to me, he's like, this would be a lot of fun if we did this. And I said, yes, it would. And then I came back and said, well, let's put a mask on. And everybody was like, well, why a mask? It's so cliche. And I was like, yes, but this is supposed to be a throwback to the 80s slasher films. And all of my favorite 80s slasher horror films, guys with masks. And so that was like the two biggest things was flamethrower and mask for this version. And how we sort of revamp, I guess, the remake. Because I'm not a fan of remake uh, movies in general. Uh, I don't like the idea of like just taking a movie and shooting it shot for shot of a movie somebody's already seen from 1983 or whatever. Like that's not the goal. Like I think the goal of remaking was like Dawn of the Dead status, which is like they Zach took a movie that he liked and made it his very own. And so that's sort of like what Silent Night was. Is taking the movie and sort of the death scenes in the movie. Yes, I did come up with because we were like just it, it's fun when you're sitting in those in those meetings and it's out of circle of people and they're like how do we kill somebody and it's, it's a fun meeting. It's, it sounds. <laughs> Morbid, but it's pretty fun, and so uh, the the death scenes in the film were all were all. Um, but uh, I, that's more sort of my things. Like I, I wrote my first movie, but I haven't all the movies I've done since I haven't written. I've more or less worked with writers because I'm not a great writer. And if you watch my first movie, you know I'm not a great writer. Um, but it's uh, I love working with people that are better than me. Uh, so I think it fuels creative juices, and like I'm much more of a set piece. Like, come up with an action scene, come up with a death scene, come up with, like, I want them to be in this space, and I know I want this guy to cry chop that guy, and then this guy to this guy now, and you tell me how they, what they say in that scene to get that accomplished. That's sort of like, like how I am, because I'm very animated in when I'm talking about that kind of stuff and how I want scenes to play out. And so it's much easier to have a writer there that's just like, and then does his thing. So, uh, but yeah. Um, as a director, I'm sure you grew up knowing what a director does and seeing the movies before you actually directed something. No. Well, I'm sure you had a basic idea of what a director does. What is something that like you got on set and it completely was wrong? Like, oh crap! Like, I mean, I, you know what? I, I guess you're right. Like, I mean, you understand? Like, I guess the biggest thing is people think that you can teach directing, which is wrong. Because I think directing is an instinct. And so I think when I got on set, the first thing that I did wrong was mechanics and thinking. I had all I did was say action, cut, and like and and, and sort of walk through the scene that way. And I like that was completely wrong. Like because it becomes then it, it becomes mechanical and I learned really quickly after the first day of shooting my first movie, uh, I learned how to deal with actors really quickly. Uh, because uh, I thought they just act. I just thought they'd act I didn't, I didn't really understand that I was supposed to interact and, and get them into it and go with this and do that. So, you know, I literally, I think the first day, the first shot was just me saying, okay, action, and everybody just stood there, you know, and I'm like, why isn't anybody doing anything? They've read the script, you know, what's going on? They're supposed to be running and jumping, and, and, and I really realized that's not what happens. And so, um, it was a good learning experience. My first, like, I was telling him, Thomas on Transfusion, I got bought, was never supposed to be seen. Like, I, I was shopping it around, hoping it was gonna be like, a uh, El Mariachi type thing, like where somebody was going to go, oh, we want this, but we want to remake it into something really big. So when someone decided to put my first movie out for me, see, I was like, oh man, this is bad news. Like this movie, if you watch the movie, it's like there's like crazy things going on that I would never do now. But actually, you know, I learned quickly. You know? So um, yeah, I mean, 
you know, I, I guess it helped that I grew up studying cinema just on my own, like watching movies daily, and, I, and I, that was considered studying to me. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of learnings. The biggest one was dealing with actors, but the, the second one was probably uh, dealing with my DP and how he choreographs the scene. Like, uh, at first I was letting my DP do everything, and then I quickly realized that I could, I could tell him what to do. And so uh, it became a much different experience once that I learned that, because uh, yeah, I think it's important for a director to infuse his ideas with the DP, because if you let your DP do whatever he wants, then I think it's not your movie anymore. Uh, and I think they're great attributes, obviously, the lighting is amazing, like, it's such an important thing. But I'm, I'm very involved with the shots and with how they move and how the camera flows, because I think that's important into the film itself. I mean, uh, in the Thomas on the first movie, the, the big thing was handheld because I wanted the idea to feel like it was the end of the world and like you would not be in some kind of still space. So it was like everything had to be shaky, everything had to be crazy. Um, and then when I went to make Under the Bed, the idea was we started the movie off very smooth and then gradually moved the movie into handheld by the end of the film. Uh, and all subconscious, like, I think once you, once I started learning that kind of stuff is where I started to really feel like a director, I guess. It's like, oh, I'm understanding why the camera moves, why I'm shaking the camera here, why is the camera moving there, and uh, uh, I think that's important. And I think that's why you make your first movies, you make them. As many as you can, whether it's web series or movies, you make them because you learn. And you learn how to make those mistakes, and you're not making mistakes on movies that people don't see, really. Maybe, but, it, you know, I think it helps. Does it get stressful while making movies? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, like, uh, it's one of those things. It's like, uh, especially when we are on the level where we're making movies, where it's like, you know, last year I made two movies for hundred thousand dollars, aggression scale, under the bed, before I made this movie, and uh, we made those movies in twelve days. And I think under the bed was fifteen days, and you just you have like eighteen locations, and we also built everything under the bed. Like I was a huge thing for me was to build the house, the interior of the house, because I wanted rooms to be bigger, by the movie to be smaller, so we had to build a lot of things. Um, and uh, that's extremely stressful on a movie for $100,000, because you're, you're, you know, your builders are stressed, the guys, the set, de set department's stressed, because they don't have enough money for a set design, and they don't want it to look like a bare set. So um, I think stress is just part of it, yeah. Uh, but I think it's how you deal with the stress in the moment. I think. For me, it's about turning that stress into just fun. I, I try not to get stressed. If I'm stressed, I usually just, we'll, we'll usually stop and we'll, I'll try to tell a joke. I'm not good at jokes. And so everybody knows that, so it becomes really less stressful when I'm <laughs> out there embarrassing myself in front of everybody. Um, but um, yeah, it's definitely stressful. But it's fun at the same time. I think, I think I, I, when I get stressed, I always think about the people that aren't doing what I'm doing. And uh, it becomes a lot more fun to me because I could be working at Subway or something. And, and like, so, you know, I really focus on that, but I'm very fortunate to be able to do it. So I, I focus on that quite a bit. Um, to help you out, what do you call a fly with no wings? A fly with no wings? Okay. A walk. So you can use that on a set. <laughs> I should use that. Oh, yeah. I, I see, you should tell that joke for me because I would tell it, but people would just sit there. <laughs> Even if it's funny, people just, I'm like, dude, I got that from Seinfeld. This is funny. <laughs> it's funny. Have you ever had any experiences uh, working with difficult actors on set? Oh, yeah. I, I think all actors are difficult, in my opinion. <laughs> I think, I think they, they're just, because they become so engulfed in this role. And so when you when you go to say, hey, I think maybe we should do this a little bit different way, it becomes worldwide. And then you then it becomes a conversation. So yes, I mean it, it's just part of the, the job is is um, actors wanting to have their way and do their thing, which is okay. I mean that's part of what it's part of uh, what my job is is to wrangle them in and make sure that I'm getting my movie. And uh, it's uh, it's one of those things that they they, they are difficult and I. I've dealt with that, but I've never dealt with anybody that has walked off set or like, you know, a diva type situation. Difficult, eh, you know, that's, 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 I take that as, that's what it is. And so, um, being crazy, maybe a few times, you know, I've had like threat, the hurt threats to walk off. Um, but I'm usually the kind of guy that's very like calm enough to talk to them and get them back to where we should be. And it's usually never about me. It's usually like the scene isn't working. 
or we're shooting this too fast because that's a, whole, a big deal. Like trying to do two or three takes for more experienced actors is not fun for them. Uh, and so, you know, it can become very frustrating to have to do, uh, like Silent Night, um, the entire end of the movie from the time Santa comes into the police station and there's rain, the, the, the sprinklers are off for the, the last five, ten minutes of the movie. So from the time Santa comes into the police station to the time Jamie kills Santa or kills Santa, um, we shot that all in a six hour time span. It's like a ten minute scene with her going through glass, stunts, and axe fights, and like, I, you know, in six hours is like ridiculous. It's not, it should never be that. And so stuntmen are flying through around and they're, you know, getting upset. And so, so you're obviously going to have tempers like flaring at that kind of a situation. Um, but I think, you know, it was the great thing about it was that we had already had a relationship like I talked about, but we could all like come to them and be like, you know, let's relax, we're going to get through this, it's not a big deal. Because, you know, the biggest thing is that you don't want to let them, you, you don't want them to think you're out of control. Because if they think you're out of control, then all of a sudden it does start to spiral out of control. So I think the key is to, to keep everything locked down by the throat. Yeah. How afraid of you are stereo? Are you afraid of stereotyping yourself as like a horror director? Yeah, 100%. Like I think that's why, um, that's why I chose to do maybe like the aggression scale, which was like not, it's, it's different than a horror movie. Like it's still interesting enough that bumped into the horror world of like, the, the critics and like, oh, it's a great horror movie. I was like, it's not a horror movie. <laughs> but anyway, like, so uh, even under the bed, like, it, it is more of a, it's more of a drama. Like, stand by my, stand by me is, but once I bring the monster, in, it's obviously horror. Um, so it, it's one of the things that I'm like, it's heavy on my brain all the time. Is like, how do I branch out? How do I make sure that I'm not making just silent nights for the rest of my life? And like, how do I become the guy that, like, tr like Sam did from Evil Dead to Army of Darkness? So all of a sudden, you know, I mean, obviously he did movies in between, like Love and Game and The Gift, um, but then to make Spider-Man, it's like, you know, how does that happen? How do you make that leap like that? Mm -hmm. and, and I always look at Sam because it was in 20 years, and Sam was in the business for 20 years before he's made Spider-Man. He was making, like, Evil Dead 1980, what, 79? So it's like 20 years that it took the dude to get to Spider-Man. And so um, I always kind of take comfort in that a little bit because it's like, okay, I'm, I'm doing okay. I've only been here five years, and I'm, you know, I made four movies, so I feel, feel okay. But it's like, now, like, the next movie that I'm making in July is not a horror movie. It's totally thriller in the, in the vein of, like, Taken type status. So um, those are the movies I want to make. If, if you're asking what movies I want to make, I want to find my Taken, or I want to find my like, Born Identities type of things. So those are the movies that I really want to make. Um, and those are sort of, like, what I'm searching out for. Like, movies that I've been attached to, like, the one I'm making in July. I've got another one that I'm making in October, and then another one that I'll be making next January. Um, and all that are sort of like bigger, bigger, but none are horror movies. Uh, sort of like my thing this year is to not make horror movies. In fact, I was like on the search for a comedy this year. It didn't happen, but then I put that out there to my agents. Like, I want to make comedy as a well point because I think it's important that I sort of branch out and do other things so that people aren't just like, well, this guy can only live in this world. And I could probably live in that world and make those movies forever, to be honest, because horror is the thing that's never, it's always huge. People always want to go see it, and and uh, I would gladly make it if it's really fun. But for me right now, I'm just like, look, okay, I think that's that's different because it's important. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm asking some questions. Man. No, that's good. Uh, you know, when you came to uh, you know California, mm -hmm. you had all come a lot of university, and it was it was more like it was you know connections and business sides mm -hmm. more than artistic. Yeah. Would you say um, back then that business is just as important as artistic? And is it still that way today for you? Like, do you still feel like it's a, it has to be a kind of balance, or is yeah. it one way or the I think I think it becomes a lot more business than it is artistic. Like, especially right now, then then it was about business as well, like meeting the right people to get me into the right rooms. I don't think that'll ever change. I think as a as an artist, you have to be willing to take one team do what they want to do before you get a chance to do what you want to do. I mean, that's just how it works. I mean, I I don't, I never went into this thinking they're going to go let me make my $30 million action movie I have in my brain that's sitting right here for them to read. I'm not going to let them do that. You know, it's just not what happens. I mean, if, if people like Neil Blancoff that can go make District 9, the great thing about 
the, the beginning so people don't know about Neil is Neil was in the VFX world since he was 15. You know, I mean, he was, he was using it in her world for 10 years, making the connections before somebody finally let him go do it. In fact, he's been doing shorts like Halo and all this kind of stuff. So, like, there, there's a lot of behind the scenes that people think that, like, people just jumped up there. It's just it's not the case ever, really. It's always about making something for them. Or, uh, you know, and, I, and I, I don't look at Silent Night as, like, sort of making one for the band, but it's in that world because it's like I was getting constantly told that from big studios that want to make movies with me that were like, we can't just necessarily go give you $50 million. We need to see something made for over a million bucks because at the time I hadn't done it yet. And so when Simon and I was brought to me, it was like a very quick yes because it's a $3 million movie. Of course, like I need to do this movie for my career. It wasn't necessarily about my artistic choice at that point. It was about what's going to elevate me to the next level, to work with actors at the next level. That Because that becomes a big deal for a director too because it, when you're making these movies, it's all about foreign sales, okay? So when I'm doing the foreign sales, they, I have to be able to get a certain caliber actor to sell that form for that movie to work. And if I can't get that actor, then they'll easily find another director that can call that actor and get that actor. So it becomes very important for me to work with a caliber talent like that, so that way, if I need them for another one, I can call them, or I can call them and say, hey, you know the diet, can you call them for me? You, let her, you know what I mean? Because my agents could do that. They could easily make those same phone calls, but it's much more personal if it's coming from someone that's already worked with me. And it becomes, and so it's, the business aspect is so heavy that it's it's like, uh, it's always gonna be there. And, I, and I'm totally fine with that, because it's like I said, like I, I'm not really wanting to make my passion, like under the bed's my passion project, but I'm not really wanting to make my passion projects to be like Sundance and like, you know, I'm gonna struggle to get that movie out there. It's just not really my thing. Like I, I, I wanna make big, fun movies. And so, uh, I'm willing to like sort of take a hit and be like, okay, it's not my greatest artistic check, it's not my best movie ever, but it's definitely a movie that looks bigger. Like Side of Night's the biggest movie ever. It looks the biggest movie, you know, it looks slick, it looks cool, it's like, definitely looks bigger than Aggression Scale, or even Under the Bed, Under the Bed looks pretty big, but it doesn't look as big as this. So, um, yeah, this is the yeah. So the connection is obviously the number one thing in Hollywood to do. Yeah. So, I think so how would somebody go about wanting you to direct your film? Would they, or the studio send you the script, you read the script, you look it over, I want to do this film, or? Yeah, now it's different too, you know, because now now I have, I'm at UTA. So UTA is obviously a gigantic agency, so my manager, my agent, and I have a manager. And so they sort of tag team on getting scripts that get sent to them, and then they're sent, filtered through to me, sort of like, by what I tell them, hey, I'm, this is what I'm looking at to find right now. So then they'll filter it, they'll send it to me, and then I'll go in and pitch the movie and to the studio, and this is my take on the movie, this is what I want to do, and then, it's never just me, you know, I'm like you guys, when you go in for a role, like I'm pitching against like 10 other directors, like Eli, Rob, and you know, like the, the biggest guys out there, like that's the thing, I know that. And so it's always about having to try, like what I tell you, like what do you have to do to step up your game to get noticed? I'm thinking the same thing when I go into a room to get a job, like, I'm not just telling you that because I like that. I'm telling you that because that's what I do, like on a daily basis. Like, and I think it it is about connections. It is about um, that kind of thing. But it's also about being an understanding that you're going to hear no more times in your life than you will ever hear yes. You know, you will hear yes one out of like the hundreds of thousands of times. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how many times I've heard that. I mean, like it, you know, it's insane. I, I've been up for great. I mean, it was between. Me and dude for Last House on the Left, me and dude for Friday the 13th. It's just like, you know what I mean? Like, I, like I've like i been there to get those bigger movies and I just haven't, and that's part of the game, you just keep going. And so um, it's uh, it's definitely about meeting those people though, because what's great about being in those rooms and pitching those movies is not just that I'm trying to get that movie, now I've met with the producers of that movie. Yeah. And now they know me. And they might like my pitch, but they can't necessarily give me $80 million to make a movie, but they like my pitch. So the next movie I'm making in July is with Cassian Owens. Cassian did Lawless. Uh, he did the Boondock Saints back in the day. But Cassian's like a gigantic guy in the buying, selling market who's been doing this since <coughs> before I was born, probably. And so Cassian, interestingly enough, was the first was the person that sold the foreign rights for my first movie. And so it's one of those things that like I've heard from Cassian in five years. Yeah. But he comes back to me with a movie that's really big and says, "Hey, I loved." Tom Tom, you did a great job with that movie, you made me a lot of money. I have this movie, I want you to watch it. So it's 
it, it is about, if it, it takes five years to get that person to come back around, it takes five years. And, and to be honest, I'm just now starting to see that sort of work that I put in five years ago with all these people that were my managers and agents put me at in meetings with and are now becoming the heads of studios and the heads of these companies that are, have a lot of this money that's being filtered out to make these movies. So now they're going back to going, well, who do we meet? And who do we see? And who's doing things? And then that's how it works. It's like, I was telling you, it's like, anybody that comes to me and says, my friend, I've had friends come to me. I'm coming out to LA, I've got six months, and I've got to do it. I'm like, well, you should just not come. <laughs> because it's ridiculous. Because like, like five years in LA is one year anywhere else, or any other job. That's <laughs> period. That's it. That's all it is to it. Like, if you wanted to be like, you know, a mechanic or whatever, like whatever that is, like you could do it in a year. You could find a job and move up. But if you want to be an actor or a director or a producer, it is going to take you time, and you just have to be. And you have to be understand. You have to be in it for the long haul because it's not going to be. I mean, there's a few guys like James Wan overnight. You know, saw him, boom. Yes, there's, there's definite possibilities, but I think that's one of those things that you have to keep in the back of your head and just be be firmly realistic with yourself and the idea that it's going to take you time. And uh, over time, you'll meet people, and those people might not pay off right away. But like I said, like I'm starting to see sort of like the fruits of that planting that I did five years ago, where now these guys are coming back, going, "Hey, you know what? We saw signs. We loved it. We didn't, we didn't even know you've been doing it. Where have you been? You know? Or we loved aggression scale. South by Southwest was a huge deal for me." It got a lot of attention. People were back on that with me saying, oh, well, Stephen can do this. And I was like, well, I tried to tell you that, but nobody did. You know what I mean? So, so it, it really is it's like making those connections now and just not being upset if they say, well, I can't use you now. It's like, yeah, OK, I, call, I still call those people. Like, email them once a month, every other month, calling, you know, even you know, to, to the people. Just saying, hey, guys, this is what I'm doing. Thanks for hanging out with me or whatever. Like, um, it's just sort of the world. I'm just trying to keep in contact with them. Yeah. Um, working with actors on a daily basis, I think you mentioned with Jamie King, she was able to joke around, and then as soon as you said action, she was you know, able to cry or do whatever you wanted. Um, what are some other things that you um, like to see from the actors on set um, that you've noticed from different actors? I think, I mean, there's just the, there's an idea that like, Actors, like I, I like the idea that actors are, are able to allow themselves to have a good time on set because I think if you're not having fun, there's something lost. Like, what are you doing? Like, I, I think, you know, and I think as you get bigger, it becomes harder to have fun because you sort of get stale to like what you're doing and you get so lost in that character sometimes. I think but you just have to remember that you still, you still should be able to have fun on set and joke around and not take things extremely too seriously unless it is like. You're in that world of like you're about to be in a scene that's intense. I get that, um, but you know, in other places on set, you should find yourself having fun. I like that. I I can't. If there's an actor with me that's constantly like this woman, and I you know, I can't talk to him like a normal person, and I have a hard time with that. And I've dealt with that. Um, and I and it's fine. I mean, I get through it, and they do their thing, and it turns out great. But for me personally, I have to like call it back and say, hey, I want you to do the next thing with me. Is like. I want to be able to like hang out and go afterwards and we have a drink and uh, or even on set like you know he can come up to me and tell me whatever he wants. It's not just like Steve as a director and you should say what you want that kind of thing. But, so um, it's just sort of I guess I'm just a very personal person. That's the same thing with people coming in to read. Like I'm just very personal. I like interacting with people. I like interacting with my actors. I just I like that process. And I guess it comes from how I got here. That I feel like I, nothing is too ridiculous. Like there's nothing that bad, you know. Like on set, we're all getting paid to do something that we shouldn't get paid to do, you know. Like so, it, it's a very calm feeling for me, and I, and so I always try to relay that to them. It's like, hey, you know, making a lot of money to be here. That's like not really that big of a deal if Joe Schmo over there bumped you. You know what I mean? So um, I try to like that's sort of like sort of. Yes. What would you say is the best part about being a director? Uh, I think the, the best part about it is watching people watch my movie. Um, everything else is cool, like shooting the movie is fun, all that kind of stuff, but I think the payoff is to be in a theater with an audience and have them react, because that's how I started, was uh, my dad was a huge movie buff, and I, he showed me The Exorcist when I was like 10. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, honestly, I don't remember watching The Exorcist. I remember watching my dad's reactions to The Exorcist and thinking, oh, 
But <laughs> my dad, the biggest, toughest dude I know, and his wife eater watching The Exorcist, and now he's got a cover up to his face, and he's like, oh, yeah. and like, I remember thinking, that is what I want. Like that, those kind of reactions, those kind of emotions, those kind of like reactions is what I want to do. So that's the biggest payoff for me is when I get to sit in the audience. And when Silent Night came out, I traveled around the country to different theaters, watching, just sitting and watching. No, obviously nobody knew it's not that era of it, or like egotistical, hey, I'm here. But, <laughs> uh, but I would sit there just to watch and hang out with people and see, because it also helps me know what I need to do better the next time. Like, oh, that didn't work. Or that didn't play the way I thought it would. Okay, then I got to retool or rethink about how to shoot that again. So um, sitting with an audience is definitely like my favorite part about the director, is seeing them react in a certain way. And especially when they react the way you want them to, that's the best feeling ever. It's like when they're screaming or when they're laughing, and even sometimes when they're laughing when they should be screaming is even better because you know it's a nervous <laughs> laugh. Like, oh, it's funny. He's just in a wood chipper. <laughs> it's not supposed to be funny. So, uh, yeah, that's a good question. All right, so, so that would be it for anyone. Anyone else have any questions? So we're, we're down there. Okay. We're good? Yeah. Okay. Um, I have one. Yeah. What do you think about, like, some actors, I think, with the... Um, uh, they'll take. Uh, they look at a, maybe a big budget movie versus a ultra low budget SAG movie, and I think sometimes actors not understanding the two, they think that maybe the ultra low budget is really you know they're new to acting too. They're not the you know uh, a known actor. Uh, sometimes they think maybe the low budget is not worthy of anything. Sometimes they they'll think that they don't understand the process of uh, I mean the importance of these uh, independents and the ultra low because there's there's more of those made versus the super big budget because some of these actors. Have read for you know major major roles and major uh, major budget and then ultra low and sometimes I you know seems to me sometimes they can feel like the ultra low is not uh, it's no big deal when I it seems to me that there's a lot of it going on I mean I there's a lot of it. I mean I think the the I think you have more room in the ultra low world to be what you want like to to experiment with your acting and how you want to per, how you want to perfect it because once you get into that bigger budget world you especially if you're newer and they don't know who you are, they're not going to let you do certain things. It's going to be Michael Bay coming down and yelling at you. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so I think using the, the low budget world as sort of like your, your playground and to really experiment, because I think as a director too, you should be letting your actors play in that world. I mean, you, you're not paying them very well if you're paying them at all. And so to try to force them to do something you want them to do, I think this is silly. Like you should all be trying to make the best movie you possibly can. So I think, um, the ultra budget world should never be taken for granted as far as an actor goes, anybody goes, because I think you could make something that ultimately hits like Saul. I mean, who is ultra budget? Well, ultra budget. All of a sudden, massive thing. So, uh, I talked to James about that several times and how he how he did that. And so, I think it's um, it's a very crucial part of our industry is all of us out here with our cameras just going out and making something cool, like what we think is cool, because that could be the next. Cool thing. I don't know. I mean, I think that's really important. Um, yeah. And I think pretty much with the like yourself when you did your independent movie uh, with the low budget, uh, you end up getting recognized for your abilities, your, your artistic abilities, and it led to some other opportunities. Yeah. Uh, same thing I think with the actors. Like uh, you can be in a, a smaller project, but then it gets uh, it gets artistic recognition out there, well, and therefore you get project, recognized. And then you just never know what project is going to do. It can, it can turn into something. You don't know who's watching. I mean, that's the great, that's the great thing about the internet. And that's why I think everything should be online. I think you should be putting everything you do somewhere that people can see. Because, I mean, every actor should have a website, number one. But, like, you know, so they should be able to go somewhere and find you. You know what I mean? If they see you in a film, they should be able to Google you and find you and watch your stuff. Uh, but, yeah, you should never know who's watching it. And they might, not, they might hate the movie. But they might like that one scene that you are in and say, that, that one scene was decent. You know what I mean? That was good, or whatever it was. I want that person to come back to read for me. So, um, believe me, I sit through terrible movies all the time. To when we're casting, I watch the worst movies, but I usually try. I usually will find one or two gems in those movies that are really busting their ass. So like I, mean, I can tell, like I tell what they're trying to do, or they just didn't get the right direction, or whatever. So I think you know, doing the ultra low budget movies, whether you think the guy knows what he's doing behind the camera or not. You know, this is a different story. You should just be trying to do your best work. Yes. Thank you for that. Then one more last question. One more, okay. <laughs> um, so, as a director, of course, you want to get 
how can you take a star chance to sell your film? As you said, a foreign film. So when you want to get that new star, like you just said, you, for the new film you just did, uh, the new ones who've never been on the camera before, or never. I do that in every movie. Every movie. Um, because I don't need giant stars in every role. Uh, I need them for one role. Like, okay. basically. So it's like, if I get Malcolm, I'm set. We, Jamie and McDonald were bonuses. You know what I mean? Like, and 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 it's it's a weird place to like play like that. But like, for me, it's like really only one big thing that sells our foreign, and then that helps everything. And then all of the minor roles, and not even minor. Roles, I mean, like some of the roles like in in Silent Night or Jackie are big roles or lead roles that we just found that nobody people have never done anything. With. Um, and that's important to me because I think you know I don't necessarily need I don't need names for myself. Like I just want whoever's the best person for that part. Um, so one or two I'll have to sacrifice like the name. You know, they're probably awesome for that, but it's yeah. definitely a name thing. Um, but for everything else in every movie I do, it's always I'm always searching for someone that's nobody's seen before. Because uh, I mean I want to find the next Chinese. You know what I mean? Like I want to find the next Ryan Gosling who I mean that's the great thing. It's like you want to find that guy because that like like Johnny who was in under the bed, like that guy goes and blows up, it's like with Brian and he actually made drive. He won't he won't make another movie without that director. What's important, you know what I mean? Because if he becomes the big guy, then he's gonna go to the studio and go, I want Steven making this yeah. movie. So of course I want to find that guy or girl that's gonna become gigantic and sort of like if I haven't gotten there yet, it's about again connections taking me with you. Um, yeah. So thank you for the opportunity for you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's just fun anyway. I think you, you get more out of them and they're more excited, and then you have, it's a lot more fun sometimes. And even if it's they're not bad, but if they're not really sure what they're doing on set, it's even more fun for me to like really hang out and try to get them used to it. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm never I'm never opposed to the new talent. Um, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you had any experiences, but people do. If have you ever ran into anything, or have friends that have been screwed over by someone in this industry, and how did they deal with it, or how did you deal with it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's nearly basic. Um, <laughs> if not, <laughs> if not um, like I said, like I got I was attached to make movies at Paramount, MGM, and Fox Atomic, and those are movies that I got screwed over on. You know what I mean? Like invested in. Heavily development, like process, work, like sketch art, paid for art, think everything that I could possibly do to make these movies I know were going to be big didn't happen. They just walk, they just walk away. It's something that I had to deal with. Uh, but I've had other instances where it's been even more intense. Where um, like I did a web series for our company and I shot the web series and it's, you know, that was really great. And then they just never put the web series out because they couldn't 